Hello everyone, today we talk about Irish warfare between the 11th and the 14th century. We already introduced uh, an important amount of content on medieval Irish, uh, also ancient actually, Irish warfare, Gaelic warfare, if you prefer. Uh, we have also gone in depth some uh, units as well. Uh, also some Scottish ones that, such as the, the Gallic legs, uh, as much as most of them came from the Hebrides. Um, and the Western Scottish seaboard that, of course, played an important role in uh, later medieval uh, Irish warfare. So these videos are sort of an introduction, you know, to, to the various uh, uh, regions uh, of Europe, uh, military-wise, right, to draw a, a general overview about the, the main features of this warfare. We have uh, already appreciated the distinctiveness of uh, Irish military culture that uh, as substantially backwards has however some mm, distinctive characteristics um, in uh, as a solution right to problems that other countries did not have quite in the same way right there are similarities to, to other say peripheral areas and there is a great deal of influence also from um, from different regions and not only the, the most obvious ones we will look at this together with similarities but again even way more uh, exotic contexts but this is just comparative uh, in nature so as we know um, when we look at 11th century Irish warfare we we cannot uh, avoid uh, to observe uh, the uh, existence of de facto uh, an Iberno Norse uh, culture that had been more marked on the coasts in the most important essentially uh, centers that had already of course been inhabited by the Giles but that the Vikings had uh, entrenched and fortified further and that basically are still uh, were uh, the basis of major Irish uh, cities today so in spite of the bitter rivalry between the invaders and the natives of course um, a great deal of Scandinavian influence is today is part of modern Irish culture and um, we could digress a lot just on, uh, on 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 this but you know to make the long, long story short as you know the Vikings had concentrated in fact uh, on the coastline while the uh, Irish interland had remained to some degree also unchanged through the rather heavy impact that the, the Viking invasions had had otherwise on the fact of the on the broader say, uh, say on the surrounding areas the ones that were more involved uh, with the Norse. This is not to say that of course the Irish interland had not been changed as a matter of fact it seems that Gaelic warfare suffered a true trauma and out of which it managed to sort of rejuvenate itself to some degree um, the Vikings were more advanced, were richer, more powerful, uh, more organized, right, disciplined, etc. All things that you normally don't hear about Vikings, at least compared to uh, their continental uh, counterparts in the Frankish world, but that effectively they were compared to the Irish. They had always maintained some sort of in incredible primitive um, culture, right, um, morally, materially. This was a world sort of still living in in the midst of its own, uh, you know, uh, ancient past. Right, this was a Christian country, uh, which was not the case for the uh, for Scandinavia. It was invading it, but it had had its own very way, very, very distinctive way to Christianity, and militarily speaking, it still relied on a sort of clanic um, champion-based uh, reality that was a bit out of out of time compared to the you know, just to the neighboring countries, especially at the arrival of the of the of the Normans, right, of Western Frankish culture into Ireland. I made a video about the earldom of Ulster that sort of illustrates uh, how the the Anglo Normans uh, took over, especially the southeast. Well, in that case, it's actually the northeast, but in fact, it was a more peripheral area, but mostly southeast of the country. That, as we will. Un understand now was is in fact also the better documented uh, in terms of military uh, archaeology right weapons finds etc was also the most fortified the ones of course in which the anglo-norman presence was was the strongest um, 
and in spite of the connection of course between the, the Normans and the early Norse uh, in Ireland uh, that's be an interesting topic for for another video um, of course um, the the Irish had somehow remained in in a distinctive relation in their native uh, culture to these uh, invaders right uh, to some extent the Viking invasions had led to the consolidation of some royal authority yet uh, just before the Anglo-Norman uh, invasion, we realized that basically the island was still divided into five major realms, right, that were not also inspiring a particular sense of unity within uh, the, their own territory. I mean, that there were still so many different clans competing for control, and Ireland, de facto, would not would never be unified in a political territorial sense um, and during the, the Middle Ages it would always be um, not just uh, an Anglo-Norman presence that of course considered the island as a whole as its own but you know even in the more autonomous uh, areas you realize that uh, the instability was um, at the order of the day right but you do see some concept of royalty being boosted further by Anglo-Norman influence. For example, it seems that the Irish had begun to adopt some Norman court ceremonial by this point, together with their own uh, proto-feudal uh, Gaelic way of war that um, we have documented again. It was, uh, it's just, think about feudal culture, but in, em in embryo or, or less devil um, in the, the idea of fostering uh, the, um, you know the the noblemen's children at your own your own household train them as uh, military retinues etc it was pretty much out there it was the the spirit of the Thianas this was connected to the ancient war band and so I don't have to explain now I made lots of videos about how uh, much of course of the you know Anglo-Norman retinues that you see uh, taking over um, the the island uh, in the in the later 12th century were connected uh, body and soul to, to the ancient war band living style in spite being of course a dramatically more advanced and uh, you know developed and civilized thing uh, also a much more traumatically effective and blood shedding one uh, of course against which the Irish could really do a few, right? Uh, you know what? What's the history here? I made a bit about medieval Ireland as, as a whole. Um, there was practically no political consistency to drive the the Anglo Normans out. There are ups and downs um, during the Middle Ages in terms of the actual grip that the uh, the Anglo Normans, also the 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 Irish ones, the ones that had sort of uh, naturalized as rulers of of, of land, detached from from England um, formally uh, we would go so it was especially in the later Middle Ages a sort of re gaelicization of military culture but definitely this had uh, had been possible thanks to the external influence and there was no broader force either to drive away it was just an osmotic process that could not dislodge uh, just per se the English presence the Scots had also invaded as you know uh, at a point uh, so it's all a story that we can't quite tell today as a well because we concentrate just on military military aspects right uh, if we were to observe of course Scandinavian influence which is a bit the past um, here because the Viking era fundamentally comes to uh, a halt at least not uh, an end uh, as as we'll see now, Scandinavian influence actually persists. I made a video about the Battle of Largs that involves Scotland, but, you know, up to the 13th century, especially, it was a, uh, in this Celtic fringe, uh, much room for infiltration by seaborne powers, like, say, Norma, uh, the Norway could be, in that case, and other, actually, aut autochthonous clans that had somehow remained in that hour of uh, Iberno, Norse, Scoto-Norse, um, 
lifestyle and you know creed that escaped the centralistic policies of both the, the English and the Scots, and that sort of believed in, for example, in the Irish Sea as but they had been doing ever since, right? If you drove, if you go back in time, you look at the Viking era, that hadn't really started anything new. Like the Giles had been pirates in their own kind um, from since ever, basically, uh, and made videos about the fact that uh, so the relation with the with late Roman warfare, like the late Roman Empire, that is uh, relevant as, of course, the reason influence always from from Britain have ever controlled it as a, as a more advanced civilization. Um, so I will just note a couple of aspects, and we'll talk in the end about um, the uh, Danish axe, let's say the, the Gallo-Glyx favorite weapon, a double-handed axe, so-called Danish, but we'll explain better, of course, what it is. Surely in this context, it is a legacy of the Norse times, but it's also something that leaves to to an important length, um, uh, standing on on its own feet. I'd say, but there are some earlier indicators of Iberno Norse um, warfare that are interesting. For example, there is a longbow from Balinderi that um, is, uh, let's say, almost surely. Um, a Scandinavian, a Scandinavian influence thing. I mean, don't get me wrong. Uh, I always say it, uh, the the longbow as such doesn't have uh, a place of origin. I mean, in Europe, we always had since prehistory longbows everywhere. Every single country had that. Um, in the in the sanitary uh, part of the continent, we always made the bows in one single unique way. And as you know, the longbow is also a non weapon, meaning that you know, it's just a long bow, rather, and so it's identical to uh, the way bows were always made uh, since prehistory. Um, but it is true, and we illustrated it in the videos about, uh, the, the other videos about Irish warfare, that uh, missile weapons uh, prior to the Viking invasions were particularly underdeveloped. Right, and it seems the Irish didn't have, they relied just on slings, javelins, things like that. Of course, they had bows, uh, but to an incredibly low degree, right? This this is true for any kind of sort of broader tactical development, uh, specialization, um, articulation. Say, light troops uh, is the key word here. Not even cavalry was particularly developed, also because, well, the island was covered in forests in many ways, but also and especially because of the of the lack of surplus, as we've seen among all these various clans that didn't control, but at most a provincial dimension. Um, in, it seems that, uh, by the way, at the end of the Viking era, the longbow was yet not, it was prominent in Norse warfare, it was an important um, constituent of Viking tactics, especially for softening up the enemy lines, for trying to smash in them, but still, by the natives, used mostly as a hunting weapon, right? It's rather the uh, and just the the Berno, uh, Scandinavian coastal communities that made the, the the greatest use of it, right? So as an actual weapon of war, doesn't seem to have become particularly widespread until the Anglo-Norman invasion of the late 12th century. And part of the reason was, of course, the anti-cavalry function. Um, the, you can argue, but you just said the Vikings had, you know, this um, tough infantry lines, you know, why not? Why didn't uh, this develop also at the time in Ireland? Well, in, in a sense it did, because was boosted by the Vikings, but in this absolute term, because, of course, also the, say, Irish Vikings didn't swim in gold, right, in spite of their better sort of international connections, slave trade, etc., um, uh, were, I mean, those occupying uh, an area like Ireland were sort of the underdogs of the situation. There was very few surplus also for them conquering the place. So, yes, they lived more as lords, uh, etc., but they uh, tended, of course, to adapt 
as well to, to the local warfare. And so apparently not even among them it was particularly um, uh, important, right? Consider that the longbow is also, um, uh, let's say, a weapon you want to use en masse for, for the sake of power. If you have to fight against constant guerrilla with this Irish... Um, uh, carrying out uh, hit and run tactics, uh, disappearing in the forests, in their hidden paths, etc. Well, there's not much you can do about them. Right? You would adapt, as we will see now, to something more, um, uh, more dynamic, more in line with the local folklore, let's say. Um, in fact, at the National Museum of Dublin, we have in an interesting set of spears and javelin heads, um, which date, in fact, uh, to the same uh, Iberna Norse period. Here, it's difficult to date them. That's something we will see now. We, we have actually a lot of missile heads, um, evidence that are difficult to date, uh, both because in Ireland technology was not that developed so throughout this time, and so it did not evolve faster than in other places in Europe, and a bit because they're just, you know, certain dart heads, uh, right? And um, there are, among the various examples, some relatively light weapons that were, again, bear in mind, we do not have the shaft because that rot away, but from the heads, we can say that we're almost certainly javelins, all right? And javelins were quite a thing among the Celts, uh, uh, of the, especially the Celtic fringe of the British Isles among the Bretons as well um, and this had developed its own distinctive kind of uh, uh, in fact tactical uh, consequences we'll talk also about Breton warfare I realize I made a video about medieval Brittany but sadly enough we talk about Wales we've seen how the Welsh did use uh, javelins uh, as well uh, a lot, and this is again typical of these uh, clanic peoples that tend to um, unite just for very few emergential situations, and then they hit the enemy if they're able to break it good. Otherwise, they run away back each to their own land across uh, hidden um, routes, uh, etc. And the interesting aspect about this is that it this dates to um, like we can't really tell whether it's a local Irish, uh, native Irish weapon here, or a Viking, Scandinavian one. But we think, of course, that the, the as we've said, the Norse would ad adapt to, uh, to this local warfare and adopt such kind of weapons, right? And if you consider what these javelins are also technically about, um, especially at this time, this early in time, it reflects a lack of body armor and even helmets in Ireland. There is really nothing strange about that because, again, the, the country was particularly poor, right? Material culture was incredibly archaic um, and we lacked some of the most basics, uh, basic elements in uh, the local panoply. Albeit, of course, the, the ultra-elite of the Giles would more or less model themselves on the... Uh, on the Anglo-Norman uh, panoply that, of course, was um, updated, uh, to say the least, uh, especially in comparison to them. Uh, but, say, maybe, I don't know, lacking leg armor, because it costs too much, even for these guys, for, for the, lo the Irish elite's coffers. This is a bit like in the Berno Norse era, uh, the same reason why the same Anglo-Norman invasion, after all, was not complete, right? Ireland was not, it was hegemonized by, uh, by the Anglo-Normans, but it was not wholly occupied, right? Actually, the, the English uh, controlled no more than half of the island, and the fact that they didn't care too much about the rest, admittedly, uh, but this still reflects how, of course, the, the local, Anglo-Norman society was sort of um, different from, say, the 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 hardcore center of, say, the uh, the English power, right, French power, and so on. Uh, we will see how these influences, also from places like Flanders, for example, played uh, in uh, in Irish warfare. 
um, this local Norman Irish aristocracy, we can call it this, evolved within uh, this conquered area in, in the southeast, while a Gaelic nobility continued to rule the rest of the country. Of course, they married into one another, but again, the differences were, were important. In the 14th century, you realize that the Norman Irish effectively dominated uh, the island as a whole, as they had become, again, a local power rather than a, rather than a foreign right, uh, one uh, grafted uh, on the island. And they had come to terms with their Gaelic opposite numbers, while both recognized the increasingly ineffective suzerainty of the English crown which was a way just to legitimize their own personal power. In other words, in more primitive times, where the Anglo-Normans were invading, the Irish were like, you know, yet another outsider. Uh, let's escape that, let's resist that. Later on, when uh, feudalization, the late medieval crisis kicked in, and, uh, let's say, the English became de facto less threatening, because they had less resources, um, on their own, uh, they sort of accepted more just in the game, uh, in the game of power, the uh, the, the a role like in in the in the Anglo in, in the English hierarchy, uh, even though it was still in the Anglo-Irish hierarchy. We were to pick uh, certain, say, the most distinctive characters of Irish warfare throughout this time, right? So something that is not merely, uh, you know, developed from the outside, etc. Uh, we can stick to this. So first of all, as we've seen, that the political and social reality had um, a relatively restrained war to a smaller affair compared to the ones of mainland Europe. I mean, at this point you have feudal monarchies able of fielding armies of 30,000 men. The Irish technically could as well, but they are again lighter troops. And more often uh, than their uh, say um, Anglo or continental counterparts, they fight with sm much smaller forces. Of course, Irish warfare seems to have consisted of essentially cattle raiding, combats between champions. This stuff, again, was pretty old. Conceptually, it, it is really a testament to the backwardness uh, of the system. But, of course, we can spot also uh, uh, an improvement, right, through the resources of the time, the, the, this gradual feudalization, the uh, increasing sort of um, formalization, in, institutionalization, primarily through the, the Anglo-Irish uh, governance of the same uh, Gaelic uh, uh, aristocratic policies, uh, uh, etc. Um, the Viking invasions had changed the character of war compared to the even more uh, primitive times. This seems to have been the case because of the number of people involved in individual encounters after all this did look at some point like an external foreign invasion so the definitely the irish did have a sort of um proto-national feeling in theory that there was a, a monarch of, of the entire island there there was a sense of course that this was a people that shared a common identity language etc just the capacity in fact of a single ruler to extend control on the entire island was um nominal at the best uh, and just in f for brief times uh, in, in Irish history and even when a single ruler was formally invested of this title it did not right the, the high king of Ireland was not really capable of controlling the whole the whole region um, the Vikings had brought the Irish to a call to colonize more to um, start seeing themselves not just as a universe on their own, which they had never fully, you know, 
believed, of course, they had always been quite um, out there, uh, exploiting the various uh, crises of Britain during the late antiquity, the early, the early Middle Ages, as pirates with incursions on their Kurax um, and so on. Uh, we talk about that and we'll keep talking about it. Uh, the Vikings forced the Irish, however, they were technically invaded uh, on a large scale, um, uh, say in a very concentrated fashion, not by the Iron Age, Celts that had been a much more gradual thing, by a, again, pretty aggressive, uh, pervasive, and compact, uh, battle-hardened uh, foe in the, uh, even modest, compared again to, say, continental Frankish military organization, uh, Viking uh, war bands, right, and, uh, you know, sailing across the seas and, uh, again, settling on the Irish coasts, um, raiding the interland, selling the natives of slaves and so on. Um, and uh, especially the need, in fact, to reclaim uh, lost settlements, the, the one facing uh, an enemy of that um, of that capacity in open field had obliged, just as war does, like unavoidably uh, a synchrosis of peoples, as long as these are not literally wiped out, at least by one another, this is not the case. The adoption, in part of the same tactics, we've seen it before with a, with a longbow, with a tougher line infantry, even surely the, the, the Norse boosted for further some Gaelic cavalry development as well. So sort of just more larger scale, more complex, articulated uh, military organization, tactics, uh, and strategies. Um, material culture, as we've seen, was announced by the Vikings. The, their chain mail, their uh, double-handed axes, uh, their longbows were something that hit hard, literally, the, the softer uh, li likely or actually unarmored Gaelic targets well, making the, the latter you know uh, at least coping with with this asymmetry in in a way that was trying at least to gap it not just running away and we know that on this channel I did make a video uh, recently that is titled Medieval Irish and Early Scots Army Organization that looks at at least this specific uh, branch of, uh, of military history between the 7th and the 11th century so that can be uh, the video for you and we will show but we will have to deal with battles with, with tactics so something uh, more more detailed right that is detailed enough as far as the army organization really goes um, Irish warfare had been at the heaviest in melee about swords and axes, aside from, of course, spears, a more universal weapon. But this is what the, the Irish had fundamentally opted for, uh, showing actually that the degree of armor did exist. Where you find axes, you know that there is some armor target. Of course, this seems to have been announced too during the Norse period. Um, however, uh, these appear as still poor weapons and they keep being sort of outdated also in the following centuries when still better ones were around, some elite uh, uh, member would of course be able to purchase from, from England or, or somewhere else, uh, and, um, and that, however, the majority of the natives was keeping to fight but the majority of those who could afford even those weapons were quite a, weapon types that were s somehow expensive um, would do uh, archery throughout all this period also remains extremely primitive right it seems that the Irish were using it mostly for hunting if not virtually or entirely for that uh, we have observed how, yes, there were longbows around, but it's something, it's a, it, archery is something that kicks in as, as a military thing just relatively later, and the purpose being taking down, especially the Anglo-Norman horsemen. The Norse had been using cavalry to a much greater degree than what is usually given credit for, 
but there is no doubt that whenever the Irish could form some greater cohesion, of course, if they had, they would normally not stand facing uh, an Anglo-Norman cavalry charge. Uh, normally, right? There are instances in which they did, even victoriously so, but it's rare. In that case, however, the uh, said the horse was the most eligible target, also because we, we do not really, we know metal armor was extremely rare, picked somehow. Uh, I mean, it came to, to be a, a relevant thing during the 13th century, before there may have been comparisons uh, to an extent that we do not quite understand fully. But, of course, a, you know, javelin shot against, well, uh, that would have been a close range, that's the point, you know, using a bow would, would make it somehow easier. It would have been nasty enough, especially if you have lots of guys who used this. Um, and from forests, for example, that the, the, the knights would not preferably venture, even though you're just, at that point, marginalizing yourself um, on the battle terrain. Uh, and that's, of course, not a good uh, indicator of strength, uh, strategically speaking. Um, of course, slings had their dignity. They had a blunt effect that could be very uh, dangerous, uh, even for, and especially for someone wearing uh, metal armor. We find, however, still this branch, um, say archery as such, uh, pretty underdeveloped. Right, we find flint arrow heads still in use, so something again particularly primitive. Right, it's just the descendants of the Viking settlers, and especially the ones of Eastern Ireland that may have made greater use of the bow. Right, the latter lands would were eventually uh, f falling under, you know, becoming the center of, of Anglo Norman rule. So that is what sees also the introduction of the crossbow um, that will not become, it will say again also the, the local Anglo-Normans tended to adopt more uh, rustic um, way of war but of course that was um, the place where the, the Viking uh, legacy was supplanted by the, the more advanced uh, Western Frankish one we have some interesting evidence, uh, such as the cross of Muredach. I will be butchering Gaelic pronunciation here. This is from Ulad, uh, representing the betrayal uh, of Christ. Um, this dates to the 10th century. It's um, present in situ at Monaster Boise in the Count Luth. And um, the interesting aspect is the relatively short, non tapering swords used by the figures, which is something that recurs uh, in uh, especially this earlier Irish warfare. Um, you know that the non-tapering swords are essentially an indicator, we've seen it also in the Mediterranean, of the more or less heavily armored military culture that we're looking at. In, in other words, the tapering sword is the one that, like the, the stock later on, it would specialize even further when plate armor came around and so on. Can't penetrate, has the 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 capacity of probably entering the joints of, of armor and trying to break and forcing it uh, more hard. And so this is typical Frankish warfare broadly meant the heaviness of the troops brought to this um, specialization of weapons tendentially, right? Whereas lighter um, uh, more lightly armored areas such as, I don't know, the Byzantine uh, or the, the broader Islamic one. And in this case, however, also the Celtic fringe displayed instead this sort of more curved tips. Uh, and this tells us that these weapons were mostly made for chopping, meaning that uh, you would rely on cutting uh, evidently softer targets that could be cut. Right? Whereas you couldn't do that at least as simply with a with a with a blade and a non ta of a in fact of a of a tapering sword uh, for which you needed uh, or any sword for that matter that at that point has rather to trust not not to cut. We have um, also further even older archaisms 
For example, we have the so-called Shrine of St. Maidoc, also known as Aiden of Fern, so it's actually not depicted in this gilt bronze casket preserved at the National Museum of Dublin, right? But that is still interesting because the figure on it carries a sword and a scourge. This dates to the 11th century. This weapon is peculiar. It has uh, a blade with almost parallel edges and at a certain point it turns at a sharp angle to mid the, uh, at the tip. Um, it's really just also impractical to, to some degree, but these weapons have been found uh, serially in Ireland, but before this, like as early as the 7th up to the 9th century. We also see this broad bar-like pommel of the weapon that is quite of its own kind. Um, so this is one of the distinctive sort of Irish blades, but uh, we shouldn't place too much, uh, let's say, uh, let's say importance on to say on on the widespread use of the same during the period we covered now, or try to answer why they were shaped like like way, right? We have at the Royal Irish Academy of Dublin, uh, Cumdac, uh of the Stowe Missile. This is um, the Cumdac is a gilded bronze book container. It dates between the 11th and the 12th century, and it has two native Gaelic Irish warriors that are thus supposed to be. We, uh, armed in the traditional style uh, of the island. And uh, it, it's likely so, because they do not wear armor or helmets. One wields a remarkably short sword. Uh, the other has a small round convex buckler, right, uh, respectively, with a conical, somewhat conical pommel and a large boss. The latter figure also wields a broad bladed spear, which has to do, as we'll see now, with sort of l less, um, sort of less armored contexts um, as well. We have a seal depicting William of Browse, dating to 1210, preserved at the National Library at the Ormond College. Of Dublin. It's really a simple seal. The local Irish seals uh, are sort of more primitive in style than other, uh, than say in England, for example. And here it shows an armored knight of the new Anglo Norman aristocracy. We see, however, as we were saying before, that also the, the latter was sort of more old-fashioned uh, compared by the French or English panoplistic standards. The guy, it, we do not understand it wholly from, from the drawing, but probably wears a full male hauberk with a coif. Um, the helmet could be a close-fitting cervelier, even though we can't see it pretty well. Uh, he rides with a slightly bent knee, which is something normally we see in the stamps, but also in this, uh, in the Celtic fringe, uh, that the um, uh, the, uh, the the idea of being more tightly on horseback, uh, being perhaps more careful about uh, javelins thrown around, it's, it's something that could fit the Irish. Uh, native light cavalry tactics uh, in some ways. Um, surely we don't have to think that since Irish cavalry was less developed that this means that individually an Irish horseman or an Irish fighter in, in, in a general sense was a less skilled, let's say, horse stuntman. Right? It's obvious that the heavier the cavalry, sort of the most, the more lodged the knight really was, just as he was, on 
on horseback and it helped just to, to smash into into the enemy here um, we if you look even at that video I made on the Irish uh, excuse me on the Iron Age um, British chariot right you 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 perfectly know that and that includes also the Irish we talked about this in some video about ancient Ir Gaelic warfare as well was uh, was uh, really performing in incredibly acrobatic and equilibristic ways in these chariots uh, and uh, even for the balance of the same and uh, rough terrain etc so this is something you you could expect still by Irish horsemen right individually the point is that collectively they didn't have enough uh, training nor they they couldn't properly meet uh, on a regular basis with the Anglo-Norman heavy cavalry and what we see is we'll see it better now is just the Irish using some sort of light cavalry, something at least compared to their um, eastern neighbors, was too light, right, to come into hand-to-hand -hand fighting in a, in a, at least in a, uh, in an open field engagement and uh, on a large scale one, unless you know it was a very strong numerical advantage or something. Passing to missile warfare again. Uh, we again we have plenty of this even though we can't uh, date them so uh, so easily this is especially true for arrowheads and uh, while this is true for I mean in general for medieval uh, archaeology this is even truer for Ireland um, we have a set of characteristics for example we have a 12th century arrowhead which is clearly designed to penetrate armor and so we know of course that the irish had been developing surely this type of arrowheads um just uh, to to cope with especially this more heavily armored neighbors that uh, as we've seen uh, in the past of the, of the Vikings or the Anglo-Normans had actually been increasing their defenses uh, compared to the Irish that had somehow la kept lagging behind. We have an arrowhead from Dublin dating to the 11th to the 13th century preserved at the National Museum uh, in Dublin which is elongated and as such we think that it worked as an incendiary projectile because the long iron socket is good enough to wrap some um, uh, some inflammable uh, material of some sort uh, ar uh, around uh, it, it considered that this arrow has is 19 centimeters in length uh, in, uh, in total so that tells you how untypical but probably functional to this incendiary purposes uh, it actually was. We have an axe head as well from Ulster dating to the 12th the early 13th century it's preserved at the Ulster Museum of Belfast in Northern Ireland and um, this uh, this is interesting it's important to add it because they sort of illustrate the development of this weapon in this broader not just in Ireland but a bit a bit in, in the entire Celtic fringe in the British Isles um, we have essentially almost symmetrical blade for the 11th century then some upwards curving uh, evolving the 12th 13th century and the reason being likely that the of course the the chopping capacity uh, with a straight blade is uh, more functional for softer targets whereas the heavier I mean the, the more heavily armored these become you you wanna may want to concentrate more force in a single point which the curb is gonna allow you to do that right um, going back to darts we have uh, either arrow or crossbow both head at times we don't understand that um, the, the the difference is 
very uh, small also for, for other contexts. Here we are in the later Middle Ages, either from the late 13th or 15th century even. This was found at Stoke Stamp, Cranmer, in County Roscommon. And the, the Cranach, as you know, is a sort of lake dwelling, and so it's connected with uh, Celtic, um, you know, burials, the, the connection with the underworld, the, the chthonic dimension. Uh, but it's such a later weapon here, yeah, a later dark that we do not understand how it could have ended in the Cranach, because at the time they wouldn't quite perform these rituals much anymore. We don't know. Maybe it was a romantic uh, guy, and or simply this we uh, this uh, dart head ended up uh, there, just at a later date, as you would think it's it's more normal. We have a hunting arrow head, very difficult to date. Um, it dates to the early 13th century, perhaps. It's preserved at the National Museum of Dublin. And the the way it's unique is that it's actually a pretty broad arrow head, and you do not see this stuff in the West much. It, it, it's a characteristic mostly connected to Turkic Turkic influenced uh, warfare, maybe peoples in Eastern Europe, but um, actually not much even there. Right, it's very rare in Europe in the first place, and. Um, we get, however, from this design that it's rather, in fact, a hunting weapon, right? That it would have not fitted, say, 13th century Irish warfare, doesn't matter. I mean, of course, you could shoot this at someone, but preferably, it, it, it's an exception. We have a bronze pommel uh, preserved at the National Museum of Dublin. It dates maybe around 1300. Right. An interesting, of course, aspect is the fact that it's made of bronze. Right. Um, there are s several finds of bronze sword pommels in Ireland. Um, as far as I know, they have kept coming, and this is uh, interesting because it could simply mean that uh, this place had remained so back in time. Not the Bronze Age, but I mean, bronze had kept being used also in the during the Iron Age. It was a thing, also in Scandinavia, where you see it, however, to a lesser degree. Uh, so Ireland would represent this sort of untouched pool where such um, traditions would have maintained. But it tells us also something else: that is probably the blades uh, attached to these pommels were not necessarily um, local. I mean, they, they would have used them, but we've seen it recently also in other, for example, in Polish, Russian warfare, etc., that uh, especially in the least developed areas, you would have guys using the pommels and just importing the blades from somewhere else. Um, so it's likely that in Ireland they, they would do the same, right? They would preserve the bronze pommel for some reason, even with some more archaic designs for whichever also practical purpose that local warfare had sort of maintained as useful. And it would combine it in ways that are to be studied, I think. And also we can't get probably too much out of it because we do not know that the combat context to a precise degree it never will. Um, with uh, with this, this blades, imported blades, or just local ones, but they could be more updated blades than the pommel. In this case, very primitive type. We have uh, another head. We do not understand whether it's from a spear or or a, or a pike or a javelin, whatever. This was uh, from found from uh, at Cloak Castle, County Down. It dates to the 13th century. It's preserved at the Ulster Museum at Belfast. And um, it, it's particularly strong, rightly made. Uh, it, it, it's evenly designed to penetrate armor. So we think it could have been a, a pike, an anti-cavalry weapon, or something you could throw um, either very close range, like some massive javelins were quite useful in sieges, actually. Or it could even be 
the the head of a frame mounted crossbow bolt um, which is kind of similar uh, in concept right it's, it's completely normal to see even in uh, the later Middle Ages still javelins used in siege warfare were very effective against the same plate armor but in fact it had to be more massively designed like this one and uh, again it's um, I was about to say it before like when you look at artillery you have to think that this game in siege warfare or in part also in open field that's probably underestimated the degree by, by how much that is true especially for smaller artillery mobile one etc uh, there, there is not much of a drawing line between, say, a crossbow and a uh, and crossbow, let's say, and a, an artillery piece, right? In designs so and construction, they're technically kind of the same. Especially the bolts are even less distinctive, right? Um, this is true for everywhere, not just Ireland. It's just that in Ireland, this could have been sort of even more promiscuous, even though siege warfare was sort of less prominent than in, in other places, at least with more developed artillery and such. It was just much less urbanized, fortified country in, a, in an absolute sense than, than others. Uh, same problem with, with, um, with, a, with another head, maybe from a javelin, but also in this case for a, possibly from a heavy siege crossbow as well, from Cork, the county Cork, it's preserved at the public museum in Cork, uh, and uh, it's it's too large to be an, a regular arrow, right? It's too small to be a spearhead. Um, so we think that it was some sort of dart, either like a, a javelin again, or uh, or this bigger crossbow artillery, mostly for for a siege context. At the public record office in London, right, Chapter House number A, uh, we have the representation. This is an English manuscript of the late 13th century of an Irish foot soldier. So this is basically the savage Irish uh, stereotypical, even insulting picture drawn by uh, an enemy of the Giles, right? So uh, in spite of this, we can spot some actually, you know, plausible Irish, um, you know, characteristics in custom in, in equipment. For example, we have the, the fool's cap, which is um, just a part of a cloak, uh, which is similar, by the way, to the one worn by the Scots that were represented in the Carlisle Charter. So, again, it can be something that the English saw as bizarre. Uh, also for the Scots, maybe caricaturing this a bit, but still, it would have made sense, right? These cloaks, caps, or something you see often in, in uh, also much later representations of the gallo glass and of uh, also Welsh um, troops, etc. So it really reflected actually the the the, the, the realistic uh, gear that the average. Irish warrior had this man were to an important extent habituated to live in, in really wild places indeed to have a great knowledge of terrain being able again to um, hide away during guerrilla operations to to live out there in the woods the Irish had um, in the undergrowth all um, a system of tracks right uh, that um, was so thick that basically was used also by was shared even among rival clients at a certain point they reached a sort of uh, place in the forest where there was a place where you could uh, fireplace uh, that you could uh, use uh, where you could gather and uh, of course most of this was hidden from uh, the sort of the more open ground foes um, such as the Anglo-Normans but it's seductive to imagine like how many times uh, some of the latter would have ventured into the into the Irish forests maybe not to get out of, uh, of there alive but just to try in fact to dislodge um, those uh, those guerrilla fighters from there right also in the chapter house liber a we 
see uh, a baggy hose worn. Uh, the Irish have bare feet uh, in this representation. This is also accurate. This was totally normal. It's how primitive that word was. Uh, there is really no uh, surprise they would leave out there without even proper uh, footwear. Also because you have once you get a callus, basically you can walk uh, everywhere. So it's something terrifying to think for you know, our spoiled background, but really our body's made to, to grow that in a relatively short time, you will you will bleed initially, but then that resistance would be obtained. This means, of course, the Irish can move on very difficult terrain as well, what the enemies quite can't. This is typical of the Celtic fringe, but in Ireland it would r reach definitely some important peaks. This, the Irish warrior um, represented here wields an axe, which is a bit like the barbarian's weapon, uh, may be part of the stereotype, but as we've seen, it was an actually typical Irish uh, weapon, so and there's really nothing strange. It's it's a hand uh, handy weapon also in in the in the in the wild, right? You can do a lot with that. And in fact, regarding to this sort of even secondary weapons of very practical use, I mean, you could cut. Um, wood skin animals and something like that we have a very interesting find that is an early 14th century dagger i don't know where it was found um the dating can vary but it's um preserved at the national museum of dublin and it's also a very beautiful piece it has um exceptional decorations um it, it's similar to the so-called burgundian knife that is what makes us date this to the 14th century, maybe a late medieval weapon. And while it does represent as a side mm, dagger, let's say, to the like the Scramasax, or sax, like it existed during the migration era, it's particularly different uh, from the Germanic tradition. It's and quite distinctive. Uh, of Ireland, at least in this in this find, um, the sax had a curved, or angled, back and straight edge. Right, this Irish dagger instead has a broad, straight, and considerably decorated back, and a curved or angled cutting edge. So it's significantly different. The functions we can imagine being similar. Right, but it's still some sort of um, distinctive Irish typology. It's not properly, uh, I mean, conceptually, it, it has the same function, can have a sax, but with its own uh, opological uh, uniqueness. Speaking of the Anglo Norman influence uh, on Irish warfare and arms and armor. Uh, we naturally appreciate how Irish, the Irish military uh, developed, starting from the 12th century, inspiring itself to Anglo-Norman systems. Admittedly, this was a normal feudal one, but the interesting aspect of this is not just that the Irish didn't have that yet, and they sort of had their own time to catch up with it, um, with, as we've seen, la lagging severely behind. But we do find uh, influences from sort of broader area. For example, we find Flemish elements among uh, the same un so-called Anglo-Norman settlers, but consider that just like in 1066, those mov who moved uh, into, into the British Isles were a quite mixed bunch. There were lots of Bretons, in fact, of Flemish together with the Normans. There were also other groups, right? The F Flanders would later grow into one of the most prosperous areas in Europe, but at the beginning of this period, it was still a, a rough country. In the 12th, uh, it was expanding, there were population excess, needs for new land, etc. So some of these guys went. To, over to Ireland, they joined the Anglo-Norman 
impetus and uh, enterprise, you know, that uh, essentially Ireland was colonized by a series of adventurers that moved also in a quite autonomous way from from the same England and in fact established themselves in even to a very important degree of independence in, in the land uh, over the locals but still detached from outer uh, controls. So it was really a far west, far northwest um, to, to a degree. And the Flemish played also an important military role. Right, They had their own infantries already at the time having a significant uh, impact capacity as much as their demographic um, impetus would suggest and they had again uh, hunger for, for land. This happened in the mostly in the southeast of the island as we've seen whereas in the rest of the country in the west specifically in the north Scandinavian influence albeit modified by the local Gaelic customs as we've seen remained right uh, even after the Anglo-Norman invasion simply because in spite of again the decline of the Viking era there was still an active Scandinavian uh, contact Right in interaction with uh, with Ireland, um, we do not get it um, quite clearly defined or documented, but we do know that Scandinavia, Northwestern Scotland, and parts of Ireland were significantly uh, visited by Scandinavian settlers, traders, adventurers, and there was even a sort of military organizational continuity with uh, properly Norse times. So these areas had been uh, Norsified by, by some extent. When we look at the Anglo-Norman influence uh, in arms and armor, we can look at some examples. There is a sword dating to the 11th to 12th century, uh, preserved at Boonratty Castle in County Clare. We're not entirely sure uh, where this comes from, uh, specifically whether it is from England or some faraway place. Uh, surely, however, almost surely, it's not an Irish manufacture. Of course, you would have local, even before the arrival of the Anglo-Normans, Irish smiths were capable, of course, of crafting the finest weapons, right? But uh, even so, this one does not reflect a native Gaelic or Scandinavian tradition. So, at most, it could have been inspired by still the most updated sort of Western developments as opposed to an Irish uh, tradition. And in case it was imported, we do not know how far away it could have come from, by the way. We have uh, another sword from Derrymore in Westmeath. Uh, it dates to the late 13th, early 14th centuries, preserved at the National Museum of Dublin. And this is a typical Western European sword uh, of the time for the aforementioned uh, reasons. Also in this case, probably not made in Ireland. Um, there are, as we'll see now, some similarities with the Movilia carving, especially for uh, the Kiyon. We'll talk about it um, just after this. Um, it's surely a weapon of the elite, either an Anglo-Norman or Anglo-Irish aristocrat, right? And they could have been purchased, uh, of course, also by the Gaelic-Irish elite of the west of the island. Uh, in any case, again, it, it's an import. It's something that Ireland spectates and at best can import uh, on a systemic level. And surely there would have not been an enormous amount of imports. I mean, uh, Ireland did not, uh, you know, had it developed, had it had the resources to import 
or just to craft a greater amount of weapons on their own. They would have done so, but it's not the case. It's a very gradual spread also of this most updated technology of the time. Uh, speaking of Mobilia, um, in Northern Ireland, uh, there is a, a relief carving on a coffin lid. With, uh, Mobilia is in County Down. And this carving dates to the 12th or 13th century. And uh, here we see some pictures uh, wielding weapons, the blades we see being straight. And the Kion is distinctively um, down curving in the 13th century European style, but the pommel seems instead to be a development of the early Scandinavian styles that uh, had been preserved in Gaelic. Uh, arms and uh, uh, Gaelic swords in this case. Um, you have essentially a hybrid between the two influences, something relatively updated to Western European warfare, but also looking back at the Bernanor uh, Norse times and making a combination out of this. And we can think that uh, apologically, th these things worked, at least they worked better than um, we can understand uh, today, given that we have actually no idea how combat actually was in spite of the the best force of Hema that tries to convince you that you know things went just the way uh, they they think without being a person living in 12th century Ireland, because of course you know, moral forces do not matter, which is just a materialistic deterministic. Um, ideologism revolving uh, around uh, the fact that just having a sword in your hand or dressing up like uh, you know, a guy of the time this, this would make any difference to understand moral forces but um, that's exactly the, the delusions that we're looking at uh, most of the time when we look at southeastern uh, Ireland we uh, realize how important, of course, the Anglo-Norman presence had been for sort of updating the local Gaelic warfare. We have a spearhead from Cork uh, and preserved at the local public museum dating to the second half of the 13th century, which um, basically reflects uh, completely the... Um, the weapons, uh, like this is actually a small spearhead, but still it's identical, right, to the ones seen in England as well as the rest of Western Europe at the time. And so we appreciate not just the fact that this um, local um, weaponry is basically fully westernized in this case, but also the fact that there are more finds there, uh, I mean in southeastern Ireland approximately than the rest uh, of the country as well, meaning that there actually was wealth there, was also um, not recycled let's say, um, was more to spare uh, if you want in comparison to, to to the other areas that as we've seen tended also to uh, adapt uh, previous um, elements like of the panoply as we've seen pommels with you know, mm, uh, dating to older times or being in the older style and material on which uh, a more updated blade was mounted, for example. And that tells a lot about just the habits, because the blade, of course, was what really made the difference uh, in in combat at parity of other factors. Uh, but the habit of handling the, sp the, the blade still in 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 the more typical grip is is also an indicator not just of the different is an indicator of the different type of warfare altogether that existed in relative terms in this Irish interland as well. Um, consider again that most Irish warfare consisted throughout all this period in guerrilla warfare against the Norman Irish that kept advancing, by the way, uh, across the island to some degree, 
Uh, and uh, here we see, in fact, the javelin is laying remaining uh, as we appreciate it more uh, effective other than widespread. So you can imagine the heavier weapons being also modeled, let's say, to, to this type of warfare employed in slightly different ways by different people. Doesn't matter how at some point the Norman Irish looked like the Gaelo uh, ones. Uh, and there was an effectiveness in Gaelic Irish guerrilla, of course, uh, which is proven by the fact that, as we've seen, the island was not um, taken over entirely, but also not by large swaths by the Norman Irish. Um, and also the, the fact the fact it was was stopped by by this type of warfare it was enough uh, so of course the Norman Irish warfare was more advanced by approximation but they also had they met with their limits bringing by the way to the uh, enlistment of other uh, uh, foreigners in the latter's armies, especially from the 13th and the 14th centuries, when you have sort of a important development also in the, of the Gallo Nor uh, of the Gallo Irish uh, in, in general, like as the peak of medieval civilization and the crisis of the same, you have a sort of an explosion of this front, and you find Norman Irish mercenaries serving Gaelic lords uh, as well, which would have been normal for the simple fact again that they were all a bit mixed with one another, especially at a higher level. So even the one where you and you would um, make greater use of alliances, of uh, you had more money just to reward uh, these troops, uh, your entourage, the, the, the clientels, etc. And so this would unavoidably bring uh, to the uh, to the Norman Irish uh, sort of blend with the with the rest um, of the of, of Irish culture, right? To an important degree, they were they always had the upper hand, but as we've seen, they had their limits and they sort of homogenized over time. Um, the differences in Irish history would always remain, uh, but still, they would be they would be based on different uh, dynamics. Uh, to in the late 13th century, uh, the Norman Irish cavalry peaked, and in the f in the following one, as we just said, declined. Um, this happened for different reasons. First, a sort of gentrification, then the fact that being the richer guys around, they, they could hire mercenaries, right? Uh, in part, this invested the same Gaelic aristocracy, but not just in Ireland, as we will see. Uh, the Gallog like will uh, be the best example, coming from the Scottish, um, the Western Scottish seaboard, the Aberdeen um, Islands. I made a video actually years ago about the uh, Scottish Highlanders. Uh, it's an old one. It's one of those I blurred and still have to re-upload, but I can't. Uh, do it at some other point. We'll keep talking about the Gallic likes, of course, in um, in some depth in, in other circumstances. Right. Um, what is amazing, actually, about Irish warfare at this point is that the regalicization of local warfare in the in the, for, in, the in the later Middle Ages, albeit witnessing, of course, some degree, as we just said, of feudalization of the same. Um, Gaelo uh, Irish aristocracy um, was, was still entailing some sort of light um, cavalry and infantry tactics as the basics of the island. I mean, you could have, yes, these elite individuals who could buy full knightly panoplies, they would fight on horseback uh, on a regular basis, etc. But the, the wide majority of Irish warfare was primarily relying on light cavalry uh, as a main striking force, which means that you basically had 
guys just running uh, against the the heavier sort of western element whenever they found it throwing javelins and pulling back of course between one another the sense of lightness ended because they were on uh, equal grounds that would charge would smash into each other etc but there was still de facto light uh, light cavalry in a say in a material sense right and this was literally the heaviest that the Irish had on a systemic basis by numbers by in an effective way plus they had light infantry uh, of the traditional Gaelic style essentially archers or javelin throwers known uh, famously enough as cairns um, of course, javelin can be also a spear, right? These warriors, again, look pretty much like the the, the the Celtic ones of Ireland had always been, right? You you have, like, a, a small shield, uh, basically no armor, a couple of javelins, uh, or, or more, at least one spear and some sort of lighter ones to throw, and that's it. There you have an Irish warfare, so the, the, the absolute, say, vanilla type of troop, uh, considering all the, say, medieval uh, European uh, warfare development that had brought to quite impressive uh, standards elsewhere uh, at this time. Uh, you understand how distant, in this sense, Ireland was culturally, right, from the rest of Europe. Also geographically you can argue but not only, right? Scotland for example was not like this. Surely through the eyes of a even of an Englishman Scotland was not exactly a civilized country but uh, still they had some sort of you know of, of feudalism of, of, of monarchy that had been emerging and they had tougher infantry and so on so it's a, it's a very important divide and gap. Uh, only certain areas of northeastern Europe, I can think, were so um, uh, undeveloped. Uh, I've seen some scholars like Nicole that were even making a comparison with sort of uh, Berber warfare, the fact that um, there was some sort of just light cavalry element um, as a shock force. But even if you look at North Africa, telling the truth, there is some greater dynamism and material availability at some point. Well, of course, the the North African interland, perhaps not, but that's the degree by which, of course, this world had remained really on its own. Um, so we were talking about the armored, axe-wielding infantry known as the Gallog-like, right? This term um, means literally foreign warriors. I mean, the 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 root, the the etymological, um, the etymology of Guile, goal, etc., derives from this. It's the idea that these men were war banders, right? And, 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 and since, in theory, uh, in origins, everybody was a freeman and, and participated in this raids, uh, everybody was a sort of foreign man, right? Uh, here, um, you had actual Gaelo Irish Gallo likes. Uh, this uh, type of of warrior just described right now was again some, the heaviest type you could find around um, there would be an evolution of say actually a modest evolution of their panoply uh, over the middle ages but still it was consistent when you realize that it was influenced by um, western developments to some degree um, and uh, the, the idea is that also in, in the Scottish Highlands, especially in the west of the country, in the Hebrides, these places that had s known as Cotonors culture, and that had been more about infantry um, than uh, than uh, even just England, for example, or even the Scottish Lowlands, right? Um, would um, represent the model through which also the Irish would develop their own their own military uh, elite. Right, they had uh, again few cavalry. Um, in any case, the Gallog like was uh, prevalently a foreigner for real, coming uh, from the areas we just mentioned uh, of Scotland. 
that were admittedly even wilder to some extent, at least of some parts of Ireland. Uh, and that's the reason why the, uh, the Anglo-Irish, the Norman Irish um, elite at some point would hire these guys. Because after all, they were foreigners. They had had historical ties with, uh, with Ireland. I mean, the reason why Scotland is called Scotland is because, as you know, of, of, of the Irish, right? Of the Scots. Um, and uh, these areas um, of the Hebrides, we Western Scotland, etc., were exactly the places which the, through which the Irish had poured into, uh, into Scotland to make it Scotland from Pictland as it was before. Um, in any case, the lowlands, as you know, uh, had been heavily uh, influenced by the Anglo-Saxons first and by the Normans later, and essentially the Scottish kingdom was developing mostly on that basis. So it's as if um, these Gallo-Glags were remain uh, had uh, I mean, this, this communities providing with the Gallo-Glags had remained sort of hostile to the same Scottish monarchy. Uh, so being free, having this sort of uh, still um, say fringe attitude, uh, having also a bit of Viking mode in their uh, in their way of life as well as in their blood, because again the Norse influence and context uh, over this area had never really quite died. Again, look at the video about the Battle of Largs that can answer some of these questions. Um, uh, consider that the Scots in the early 14th century, as you know, striking back against the English in, in Ireland, had invaded um, the country as well, uh, notoriously under Robert the Bruce's um, brother. So that had, by the way, showed how sort of advanced uh, the the truly unified Scotland really was compared to Ireland at that point. Of course, they hadn't been able um, to maintain any um, satisfactory grip uh, on the on the island, but it wouldn't be the last time, as as you know, think about the wars of the Three Kingdoms uh, later on in the modern age, that of course the Scots would intervene, would even colonize part of Ireland, uh, notoriously in Ulster, um, and in fact being separated both from the Anglo-Irish and the probably the Gaelo-Irish out there. It, it's a mess, but you have to study 17th century warfare uh, and politics especially in depth um, to to fully appreciate the also the brutality of, of the rivalries between these groups that had maintained also this much more primitively brutal way of war. I mean, the Gallo-Glags were literally people born and, uh, and bred into, uh, you know, into the, the the normality that what a man does is meeting with his clansmen against the opposing ones on foot with double-handed swords and chopping each other to pieces until the last person stands. Um, and uh, these are true... I, I mean, you wouldn't especially if you have studied ancient Celtic warfare, you realize how un, uh, say unchanged, literally, these realities had been. And what is naturally fascinating is that this depended on the local communities. You see the Gallic Lakes, we, we talked about Scottish and Irish mercenaries, also in, in fact, in modern um, age Europe in the Thirty Years' War, um, in Poland during the 17th century, etc. Um, they knew the world outside. They knew how to handle a firearm. They knew how to what warfare was about out there, out there. But at home, they felt literally as if they were in the Iron Age. Uh, I mean, technically we're still in the Iron Age, but I mean, back in ancient history, or early medieval history, and literally not much had changed. Admittedly, yes, some of the elite equipment, as you know, the double-handed swords, uh, coat of mail. Um, at least to the greater extent that the elite could afford, but plate armor uh, that had come around w were there, but still to a, to a marginal degree. Often these guys could not really afford uh, that full panoply, um, but they were pretty warlike, and as we've seen, they engage in this mercenary lifestyle, which uh, to their for their standards was was quite remunerative, or say satisfactorily remunerative, uh, at least, or chasing that satisfaction uh, with the hope of some gain. Um, there was, however, also uh, an Irish 
uh, influence over Britain at this point in the form of predictably, as we just described them, were the only troops that they basically had in light cavalry, right? Uh, the famous Hobbelar serving in 14th century Scotland, England, uh, especially on, on the border between the two countries, and that's in fact guerrilla raiding sort of warfare that was typical of it. But eventually, even during the Hundred Years' War in France, and specifically under English colors, rather, which is fascinating as well, there were Irish fighting for the French as well, but at this point, the Hobbelar were more directly absorbed, but say by the English um, military market, as other enemies of the English. I mean, think about the Welsh, um, etc. It's Scotland that it's more like a counter in its own that helps the French sending troops there, um, and uh, that's yes, a, an Irish um, influence on British warfare. And we, however, do not know um, technically what broader impact it had on the military culture, say, of Scotland, England, or France. So obviously, these were just light, light cavalry men, right? We, just by number and by relevance on, on the battlefield, they would have not been the thing that significantly altered the way just the Scots, the English, or the French had their own type of lighter cavalry. But hey, these guys were sort of wild, brutal, uh, and uh, savage enough to make good, in fact, scorchers, uh, destroyers, etc. They, they, they were cheaper. Their life cost less, and so you could employ them in that role, right? And it's particularly important it's like just like the longbowmen even if they became trained professionals still the, the number of welsh that were present um in the indentured uh, units is is speaking by itself these people were the scum of the earth they came from in fact the, the fringe uh and they they were just cheap right there were lots of longbowmen really lots of them right? but they were not elite troops as as such we can appreciate the war axe tradition from the Galloglikes, uh, as well as the that um, Norse uh, influence that had remained both in Scotland and in Ireland. Right, we have war axes from the National Museum of Dublin. These were made uh, or found, at least in Ireland. Uh, they date probably to the 13th century. Um, they are, mm, at least some of them, are decorated uh, in a very similar way to the silver inlay of Scottish style. They may have come from the northwest and west of Ireland, as a matter of fact, from probably the native Gaelic era. Right, so they could have arrived there in different ways. Either they were copied, or they were bought, or they literally belonged to the Galloglikes, these foreign warriors uh, that were definitely hired as infantry axemen in Irish service to make really the, you know, the heavy infantry, and those could chop through this large amount of much lighter uh, troops. They are first recorded for Ireland around 1290, but we think that they had been uh, sort of typical around there, at least by half a century. And the interesting aspect of these weapons is they have an upwards sweep to their blades. This is very distinctive, and it um, essentially was pointing to the direction of a devil being a trusting capacity with this tip. So something that uh, you see, for example, in, in pole arms at this time, they're starting to become a bit more uh, refined, uh, apologically multitask, right, having a fracturing cut angle, but also trusting uh, capacity. So this was the response, at least from these types of warriors, from previous types of 
of axes that um, had been used in um, you know in, especially since um, Viking the Viking era in the Celtic fringe um, and it's worth noticing that uh, there had been also in countries like Scandinavia and Central Europe uh, similar axe types doubling right for example we have a war axe from Derry Hallag in County Antrim this dates to the late 13th 14th century um, and it's preserved at the National Museum of Dublin right and when you look at it you say oh well okay so this, this is a Gallic like weapon yes but it's also particularly similar to other axes that were used by the Scandinavians and even uh, Central Europeans at the time which is a pretty wide area right and you can't say in spite of all that there was such an, an intense contact at this point uh, between Ireland and those places um, so surely uh, the uh, especially in this context in Celtic fringe there was a northern European infantry tradition from which this stemmed but this sub of weapon stem, but it was also like um, a broader development that would have occurred given the fact that now European warfare, especially by the late 13th, 14th century, was becoming ever more homogeneous. So wherever they used this kind of double-handed axis, for whichever reason, there was a sort of trend that was coping with the broader evolution and homogenization of European warfare, which meant to respond to similar challenges. Um, obviously in a similar way. Uh, as you know, the um, double-handed axe is a weapon that we mostly call it like the, the Danish axe, at least we associate it to the Vikings, the Varangians, etc. But telling you the truth, this was a Frankish weapon originally, just like the Francisca was actually not a Frankish weapon, but a Roman one, simply because it was um, used mostly to break armor in context where there was ar more armor right and so these peoples had needed that the reason why we think that there were larger weapons in countries like Scandinavia or Germany um, is the fact that these countries were um, developing a sort of feudal warfare that um, didn't uh, essentially uh, uh, make much use of cavalry warfare like the rest of the West, essentially for env environmental reasons. And when we, we see, for example, still in 12th century Germany, um, uh, you know, cavalry dismounting on a more regular basis, hence the one and a half um, hand swords, the Grand de Pied d'Allemagne, so-called, some of you ask me about the Swabian mercenaries at Civitate with these massive swords or wide Danes. The Scandinavians sort of maintain this double-handed axis. Well, that's because you basically can't use them functionally on horseback. And so it's more likely, given that it's basically at this point a feudal context with a heavily armored elite, that you will make m more use of these weapons on, on foot, both against... Um, I mean, against this, this armor target or also the broader one you could find. Um, so that's the main reason, right? So also, of course, the, the Scot-Irish have, at this point, a need to break the enemy in a similar way. Uh, they don't have much cavalry themselves, so they're actually forced to fight on horseback and this is true also for Germany and Scandinavia I mean, it's not the fact that they were just heavily forested areas more than much I mean, it's just that their feudalism had been sort of later uh, developing so it's um, here it's a bit the same concept and that's why you would have this type of of um, of weapons it's, it's also a matter of yeah, that's basically it, because professionalism exists everywhere, there are mercenaries everywhere, and um, that's how this era is conjugated a bit better, sort of foot combat with this, the options that were available. We have a war axe from Coleraine in County Derry, dating perhaps to the 13th century, and it's not clear, it's preserved 
This is also preserved at the National Museum of Dublin. And um, it is definitely similar to uh, silver inlaid axes dating more or less to the same time. And it has its upward sweep culminating in a point. I made a video about the lowland pikemen during uh, the early modern age and I showed there how still uh, in the most advanced part of Scotland uh, the need for this uh, pretty uh, this can as axemen as literally line infantry line breakers was um, was there given that Scottish warfare remained also during the Renaissance importantly focused on on infantry as it had been in the um, basically throughout all the, the Middle Ages. I made a video even about Pictish tactics that illustrate how the early sort of phalanx skill turn uh, mentality and actuality, you know, being being distinctive of these people. We will explain better in other videos how and why, because Scottish warfare is somehow underrated, especially in early medieval times. But um, I think that um, when um, when you look at the development, see, Scotland went on as an actual kingdom, as an actual country. Ireland did not. So the idea is that these Galloglakes, after all, would find even a more functional employment, a more remunerative one, among the same Scottish uh, lowland ranks, to break the same infantries in large numbers as sort of forlorn hope units, etc. So um, there were also double-handed swords, not just axes, etc. But the brutality of this context was, uh, was there, was noted, and you needed to unlock a bit the the enemy front, this kind of guys, ideally. Then, of course, warfare was evolving a bit in a different direction, so this ended up to die out by the 17th, the 17th century, but still pretty late in time. After an almost unchanged kind of profile for, for centuries and centuries. Finally, we go back, in fact, in time uh, to finish uh, looking at the cross of the scriptures in Ogilvy um, Mead, and, and we're, we're in the 10th century, this is in situ at Clonmac Noise, showing different types of uh, warriors. All right. uh, this Clonmac Noise was an important center, especially because of its diocese. Um, uh, as the one at least of the main centers of the old Gaelic kingdom of Meath. And these are just crudely uh, carved figures. We are in the 10th century, they're very stylized, can't get too much. But exactly because of that, they are interestingly showing what sort of native Gaelic culture was about at the time, uh, in terms of arms and armor. There are two chiefs represented, and they have cloaks, right, as we've seen even uh, almost half a millennium later depicted by the English. Uh, they are, these cloaks are held by pairs of massive shoulder brooches, that were, as you know, in, uh, in this kind of context, uh, an indicator of status, all right? And they have short but broad swords, so this sort of more dagger but cutting style, where there was few armor, and and the one that was could sort of be stalked by these sort of uh, weapons as well, because we do not know how resistant and thick the blades were, but they may have had exactly that similar function. So you see that not fully fledged sort of long sword sense of um, let's just engage in open field and slash this thing and hit each other. No, it's sort of always a uh, hidden stabbing situation among these clanic feuds, uh, etc. Uh, and this tell, does tell us that traditional Irish swords 
were remarkably short and they are described as such um, documentary as well so this does not surprise us the pommels of these swords appear as dome shaped um, at least in one detail quite clearly they are suspended from baldrics uh, attached to their scabbards at two separate points and there is an interesting connection here um, uh, between Ireland and the Iberian Peninsula because this kind of swords were sort of similar in the early medieval period there was a connection between the northern Iberian Celts um, of today's Spain and Portugal and the Celtic fringe uh, in the north in Britannia and in, um, in fact in Ireland in, in, in Britain similar warfare really if you look at northern Iberian warfare during the early middle ages we will talk about this they're remarkably similar um, it's just how similar peoples would fight right and not much just the Celtic connection per se but just if anything the reason why the Celts had survived in these corners of Europe um, we see another warrior carved which is um, uh, displaying another similarly short sword probably on a baldric and this time the pommel is instead lar large and round in shape uh, this suggests a bit more grip a bit more need for swinging right this is essentially the evolution from you know the um, say the, the domed shape in fact you see also it's typically during the Viking year and the later European uh, long swords right because they had to fit more in the palm and such you had to really handle them because it was um, a much more dynamic and also larger uh, sword that had more forces uh, going on while being wielded etc so the hand had to be tighter on it for the rest uh, there are also certain fantasy elements so again this is a, an interesting source bringing us bits back into this the, the bowels the mist of Gaelic warfare during the early middle ages and again I made a video about at least the, the army organization um, of the same um, and uh, we will surely talk about this uh, at some point uh, for today however I stop it here I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content as always I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye